Hi, I'm Camille Zarelli, and welcome to another show with Staten Island Viewpoint, a show sponsored by the Staten Island Civic Organization. And this is our first show, actually, 2015, so we're very excited about that. And with me, as always, I have my co-host and vice president, Dr. Bruce Eisenberg. How are you doing, Camille? Good, and you, Bruce? I'm doing now, great. Now, Bruce, the first time we did this, you were much more enthusiastic, okay? Yeah, you almost scared me, out of my, <laughs> it scared me out of my seat. I know, with this about our fourth or fifth try. So, uh, how was your uh, close of 2014? It was very wonderful, and this new year has been going great. Good. And um, we look back at our annual clothing and toy drive for the needy of Staten Island. That was a great success, as always. That's and night. we thank you because you had that up for us, it's along with the Richmond Masonic Association. It's my pleasure, and um, I thank all the people out there who brought, donated clothing and toys for the needy of Staten Island. And I thank all the businesses that serve as drop-off sites. They have their businesses to run, but they open up their doors to us, and we couldn't do it without them. And um, Camille, I thank you for being such a great partner in making this oh, such a success. It's my pleasure. And you know, we have our family and our friends and our kids that participate. Right. And you know, it was very nice. Thank the Staten Island Advance for giving us um, uh, a very uh, lovely um, notice that uh, in the paper about recognizing uh, the work that we did and all the businesses. So we're very appreciative of that. Thank you. It's 19 years now that we've been doing this. 19. 19 yeah. years. And each year, you know, it's so funny because we all look forward to seeing each other. Sure. I mean, we see each other very often, yeah. but, uh, you know, throughout the year, sometimes you don't get a chance to really catch up. But right. that's the time when we all get together and it's uh, very enthusiastic. And, you know, the, the spirit of the holiday really uh, manifests itself through the toy cone clothing yeah. drive. So that's wonderful. We see Reverend Smith every year and members of his church. And uh, really, it's just uh, such a wonderful, warm mm -hmm. thing, and we enjoy doing it. Yeah, so um, again, we look forward to doing it again for 2015, and we thank everybody. So, you know, we, we're kicking off the new year with a very important mm -hmm. uh, show on lung cancer. Right. And um, uh, it, it's just uh, amazing, the statistics. Right. And uh, the brief reading that I've done about it. So, without further ado, why don't we uh, announce and introduce our guest? Very good. We have, okay. Yeah, so, we have Nancy Rooney. Hi. How are you? Thank you for having and, me. And actually, I met Nancy at the community board meeting. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so important. I actually approached her to maybe, uh, yes, you she know, did. Yeah, come on the show and talk a little bit about the, um, you know, lung cancer and the screen, screening because um, she uh, really. Um, uh, spoke clearly about the message, and uh, certainly everybody was listening in. Tell us about your role there before we introduce our next guest. Tell us about your role. Well, <coughs> my, um, my, I am the lung nurse navigator at Richmond University Medical Center, and what that entails is that I am the patient's personal nurse. They, my phone number is there. They can reach me whether it's in the office or by cell. I make the appointment for them, I do the follow-up, and I'm out there. So when they're not meeting anybody else, I'll do their I do their registration. They're dealing with just one person. I take them for the CAT scan. Lung cancer screening is a low-dose CAT scan that um, helps us to do early detection. So it's instead of having a patient running all over town, it's a one one person that is going to be there to take care of them. Well, yeah, that's that's important. They must feel relieved about that. Yes, they so do. don't feel like they're being shuffled all over right. the place because that's very frustrating when you go and you get some testing and when you're within that whole medical process. It's scary. It's very scary, mm -hmm. and patients don't know. You know, when they get a phone number, they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So they once they call me, and I'll take care of everything for them. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's a wonderful thing when people go through. This challenging situation, they're very vulnerable. They have one person there that their contact that has experience and can guide them through all the challenges. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, because you do feel reassured yeah. that there's mm -hmm. somebody there sort of to hold your hand yes. and to educate you. And, you know, it's a familiar face. Yeah. Particularly if there's bad news to follow, right? It's scary. That, you know, from the time they do the CAT scan until the time they get the phone call. It's, it's a very anxiety provoking, mm -hmm. but we want the patients to breathe easier. We want them to know what, if it's something there, that we can take care of it. 
How early long, detection. Uh, from the CAT scan to the news, like, you know, Within the results? Within 24 to 48 mm -hmm. hours. And Usually you, 24 hours. You call them to come back in? We can call, if they, if they need to come back in. Yeah. But okay. it's, um, Dr. Diaz and is. Dr. Diaz, and you are the pulmonary and critical care? Correct, I'm a, MD. a pulmonary physician at the Rome here at Richmond University. And I essentially oversee the program, so um, all the CAT scans that are done, I'll review them and go over the results and um, usually talk firsthand with the physician and come up with some recommendations on what to proceed with uh, as far as next course of action. So, Can you explain for our audience exactly what is a CAT scan? A CAT scan is essentially a series of x-rays. Um, they're cuts that are actually th through the chest. So there are x-rays in a lot more detail, and it um, can be almost like a three-dimensional view inside the chest. Mm -hmm. How does one get lung cancer? The large number of lung cancers are mostly attributable to smoking. So about 85 to 90 percent of cancers that we see in the lung are directly related to smoking. And so is that smoking over a course of time? Is it someone who's a heavy smoker or someone that occasionally smoked? You know, uh, what do you normally uh, find is the actual, you know, cause or the result of it? There's definitely a direct linear correlation, meaning that the more you smoke, the more likely you are to acquire lung cancer. Um, so in general, the people who are at greatest risk are those who have smoked what we say is 30 pack years. When I say a pack year, if you smoke one pack of cigarettes per day for a year, that's considered one pack year. So if you do smoke two packs of cigarettes for one year, that would be considered two pack years. So you have to have had smoked, you know, essentially 20 to 30 pack years in order to be considered what we say high risk. And isn't it also true that some that quit smoking over years, they can reverse, reverse almost all the damage that's done if they're caught, it's caught on time? There will definitely be uh, some improvements in lung function. That, that's absolutely true. So the person that mm -hmm. says, I can't quit, I've been smoking 20 years, it's too late. That's not true. Definitely not true. Essentially though, as we age, our lung function does decline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really, the, the saying is true, after 30, it's all downhill. But when we <laughs> smoke, that decline is much more dramatic. When you quit smoking, that decline actually levels off to the same as if you were not smoking. Right. So it's, it's well, that, always better to yeah, quit. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't think that really. Uh, absolutely. Saying, like, most people would think, well, the damage is already done, exactly. so um, you know, why bother? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, why would I want to stop? I've already created this situation for myself. But that was a very good question, actually. That's such an important message for people. It's never too late to quit. Absolutely. Well, this is the 50th year, I believe, if I'm correct, where the Surgeon General That's uh, right. has put the warning label on. Mm -hmm. So the American Cancer Society and the American Lung is campaigning to get the word out that we, you know, we've done, we've done this warning, but people are still smoking. Mm -hmm. So now we have to do something to change that as well. So with lung cancer screening. We, we're trying to change the mortality, mm -hmm. early detection, early treatment, and smoking sensation. How much of a genetic predisposition is there towards lung cancer? I think it, uh, it's, it's definitely multifactorial, but the, the, the 15 or 10 percent of cancers that do occur in patients who are non-smokers are really thought to be hereditary or, or genetic mm -hmm. predominantly. But, you know, as, as you can you know, see from people that you know, there can be 90-year-olds who have been smoking all their life and never seem to have a problem. So there definitely has to be some genetic predisposition, but I don't know if we've pinpointed exactly how, how much of a factor that is. Now, we have some native Staten Islanders among us here. Um, how does Staten Island sta rate in terms of how much smoking goes on here compared to other places? Unfortunately, we have the highest uh, smoking rate in all of New York City. Um, I think most you recently... Said that. That's yeah. what I heard. Yeah, and, w and we have the highest lung, lung cancer. And as, as in turn, we, we also have the highest rate of lung cancer in, in New York City as well. And actually, it's, it's significantly higher than a national average. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that is, that, that we have the highest rate of uh, smokers here? And is it environmental? Is it 
is a lifestyle? What do you, what do you attribute it to? I that's, mean, a, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I if I know the answer to that. And um, what do you think it is? Well, I think once people see this show, that'll end. <laughs> the problem it will stop, right? Or we'll find out immediately. They'll start writing in. I'll tell you why I smoke. <laughs> well, I I'm sitting in traffic for hours, ready to kill myself. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that Richmond University saw the need that from the statistics and said, you know what, we, we, we want to change this. We, want to, we can change the course of somebody's life because as Dr. Diaz has said, that it's, the re, it's premature death and it's a preventable cancer. We know that we can prevent this cancer. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's great. I don't know how the program actually started and how actually your position Develop because I think this is the first time. I mean, I think I said to you, like, what is a nurse navigator? I never even heard of that before. Well, it, it is the future of nursing and medicine. It, you, um, we all have a friend that's a nurse, and we always call that nurse and say, you know, I have this ache. Who should I go to? And usually a nurse would tell you, well, you know, why don't you go see this guy or go see this doctor? So it's not everybody has a nurse in their family to make that call. Right. So having a nurse navigator in different areas, there are nurse navigators in breast, there are nurse navigators in colon, and nurse navigators in lung. Mm -hmm. So that you, it, we're the, the go-to person for that for anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny, my son, when I went on the interview, said to me, uh, Mom, what type of, what is this job? What is this position? I said, well, you know how everybody in the neighborhood calls me and asks me where to go? You know, who to take, you know, they have this ache. I said, yeah. well, now I'm going to get paid for it. <laughs> right, exactly. It's true, though, you know, uh, if you run into someone who's a doctor or a nurse, like, you know, Bruce is a very dear friend of mine, but, you know, he's, he's, but he's brilliant, so I'll call him up, oh, you know, I don't feel good, this is happening, you know, and I guess you look for someone you know, not knowing or not knowing, you know, what to do next. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll say, well, it could be this. He'll advise me. Of course, he always says, go to your doctor. And, you know, unfortunately, doctor, you know, nobody really wants to go to the doctor because it's like you don't want to hear, you don't want to hear bad news, right. okay? You know, ignorance is bliss, right, um, for the most part. Uh, but, you know, you have to go to the doctor and you have to get assessed and you have to get treatment. I think it would probably be hard for most people to, uh, you know, getting back to the lung cancer, come in and do a screening because they probably it is it's because they frightening. probably know that there's going to be some, you know, for the most part they're going to something's going to be found. Particularly if you're a smoker of 30 years, maybe unfiltered cigarettes. Many years ago, you know, they didn't even have filters on cigarettes, and now you have those e-cigarettes, which they're supposed to be just as bad, if not worse because of the chemicals involved. And I think we spoke about that earlier where you said there's really no That's information. Right. There's really not many studies and there's really no regulations on, on the manufacturers so that you know each brand can have different uh, constituents within the, uh, the cigarette, so. But it's the nicotine that's so addicting. So in these e-cigarettes, e these young kids think it's so cool. They go to these vapor bars. Right. And you know, once they get hooked on nicotine, <coughs> What's the next thing? They're going to smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So it's so important, like Dr. Diaz has done um, articles about teenagers <coughs> yeah, so smoking. Teens that are actually using e-cigarettes are twice as more likely to actually pick up a regular cigarette. And that really translates to uh, a real habit that they have, you know. No, well, that, that is so a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're talking about the addiction aspect yeah. of it. And people don't realize nicotine is addicting. So when you tell someone to stop smoking, it's not so simple. Um, but I think an even more significant addiction is the psychological addiction where, uh, with the, that a person has to cigarettes. Can you address that at all, either of you? Well, when you, when you tell somebody to stop doing something, what happens? They just turn you off. Mm -hmm. So you have to find that moment when it's sort of like an aha moment or we call it a teachable moment, mm -hmm. when they're ready to, to hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's the same thing with weight loss. You can tell somebody you have to lose weight, you have to lose weight. But until they are ready, there's a, there's, they have to pre, they have to pre think this and then they have to make a, a commitment that this is what they want to do. Um, what I'm finding is when the patients do come in for the CAT scan, 
that's my time to sit down and talk to them. And when they're waiting to hear their results, that anxiety <coughs> is, their ta is that teachable moment to say, okay, let's talk about this. You came, you made the first step to come in for the CAT scan. Now, whether the results are good or bad, now let's talk about how we can change things. So it, it's a scary thing, but that's the, the moment. Let me talk about whether the results are good or bad. Sometimes wouldn't be in between. So for instance, if you find something, um, what, what are you looking for? H how serious is it? How much of an opportunity do you have to be able to c treat the condition um, based on what your findings are? So actually that's one of the biggest downsides is that it's very commonly that you find something. Mm -hmm. um, about 20 to 40 percent of the scans are actually going to see some kind of finding. Most of the time, 94 to 95 percent of those are going to be what we call benign findings or things that aren't um, going to cause significant um, health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they usually just lead to more tests. And when I say more tests, really more CAT scans or maybe a more frequent CAT scan. Um, depending on what we would find, though, if we do find something significant, that would obviously lead to more invasive, maybe diagnostic testing. Mm -hmm. you know. What, do you only use CAT scans? Do you ever, never use an MRI? Because I thought the MRI was a little bit more um, of a fine-tuning of the CAT scan, if you will. Specifically for the lung, actually, CAT scan um, has better uh, imaging potential than the MRI does. So MRI is better for different organs, per se, usually the, the brain and or um, some abdominal organs. And I think we spoke earlier, you said that if you could operate that you could actually um, you said there was a technique Nancy and then that you could actually go in and take a piece of the lung out so there's a, a wide array of treatment choices for lung cancer and you know traditionally what we've found in the past is that when we find lung cancer it's usually at a later stage and most of the time we all know that a higher stage or a later stage for cancer really means decreased survival or the, somebody's not going to do well the idea of screening is to find something when it's very early, in, a, in an early stage. And when we find it that it's small and hasn't spread, then it has the potential for actually being taken out through surgery. And that's really the best uh, treatment choice for curing the cancer. And the whole, the whole team approach, myself, Dr. Diaz, the thoracic surgeon, the oncologist, it's a, it's a multiple disciplinary team that is here to take care of the patient. Well, how do you do, oh, I'm sorry, but no, how do you, if someone has the, the uh, let's say, I guess is was it stages one through four? Mm -hmm. So let's say they're in stage four. Okay. You know, how do you address that with the family? I mean, obviously you call the family in at that point and, you know, how does that affect everyone's quality of life and, you know, what, well, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, really what we're doing at, at this program is, is actually finding the cancer um, early. early. The, whole, the whole purpose of lung cancer screening is to find, is the early detection. Where if somebody has come in and it's where you're saying that it's stage four, they've been pretty sick. So these, the patients that are coming in have gone to their doctor and said, you know, I saw this um, screening program. I'd like to be a part of it. I'd like to take the opportunity. The um, New York Times has put multiple articles out since for the past year about how early detection can save lives in lung cancer screening. The Medicare in, in, um, and the insurance programs are now going to be paying for this. Like similar, oh, to, similar to the breast cancer screenings for the mammals and colon cancer, they set a date you know, at 50 years old, everybody has to have a colonoscopy. So the word is out. So everybody knows at 50, right. they're going for their colonoscopy. They have to be and referred by their primary. They have, to be, they have to go to a GI specialist. So the new standard for smokers, correct me if I'm wrong, is to have a lung cancer screening yearly. And that's covered by their insurance. That it will be covered as of January of this year. United Healthcare has... Right. Accepted um, that this is going to be the standard. Medicare, I believe, is going to be accepting it in March, and 
this will be a part of everybody's wellness, sort of. But right. and similar to the breast, similar to prostate screening, we have to start somewhere. And so that's where the high-risk patients, 50, if they've had a family history, 55, if, and you know, with that smoking history, we right. want to get them there, not later. Sooner than later. Right. This and is based on you know, relatively new evidence, so it's a fairly new concept, and as Nancy said, most of the insurances are now coming on board with this. Um, but like you had pointed out, really the numbers are staggering, particularly for lung cancer. And in fact, it's the number one cause of cancer-related death. So if we look at the cancers that are the top killers, which is colon, breast, prostate, and lung cancer, lung cancer actually kills more people than any of those three actually combined. So what the study showed where they looked at this CAT scan as a screening tool, um, when they did implement this, they showed that there was a relative reduction of mortality of about 20%, and that's a pretty big number. It is. We have a grant through the, um, the Stonewall. Stonewall Herbert Foundation and TD Bank to screen 100 patients for free. And um, we're doing the word, is, we're, as you've seen me at the community board, right. and I'm at the Masonic, I'm at the Kiwanis, I'm at the PTAs, to let people know that this is available. And Richmond University made, took a step and said, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to, with the foundation, we want to make a difference. And we need to make a difference here on Staten Island. Right. We, I think we both would agree, as Absolutely. the community would, you know. People just have to muster up the courage and go forward. And hopefully this will also be a wake-up call for them to stop smoking. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's, is there any kind of money in, in the program for continued education? Because I would imagine ed continued education and educating people is a big thing. It's, it's very important. I mean, I think that the whole, the whole thing with the, the teenagers is to get the word out. You know, everybody, teenagers think they're invincible and nothing's going to ever happen to them. But you need to educate them. You need to educate the young adults that are out there vaporing and, and the hookah. I was the just hookah gonna, is going to... I was going to ask you about that because that is a big thing now. They have, like, places just for that. Well, they initially said the hookah wasn't, didn't have tobacco in it, didn't have nicotine. You want to uh, it, it well, what doesn't necessarily have nicotine, but it is a uh, tobacco, in, tobacco type it. product. And basically what you're inhaling, you know, all, the smoke does have a significant amount of carcinogens. And the way a hookah session works, you know, they pass it around. It lasts for quite some time. But one hookah session is equivalent to smoking easily a pack of cigarettes at one sitting. So it has a significant mm -hmm. burden. And people don't look at it the same way, right. but it definitely... You know, they, it's a social thing, but that social thing is going to kill them. Mm. It can kill them. Yeah. I never imagined just sitting around the table smoking myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, that doesn't have, for me, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think at any age it would have an appeal. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if years ago, you know, now, of course, in the restaurants, you know, but you allow smoking, which is good, or anywhere else. But, you know, years ago, we went to the clubs, mm -hmm. and after dinner, you know, people would have a drink, and they would smoke, because it seems like if you're drinking, there's a higher, you know, frequency of smoking. Because it's, you know, it's like cool, right? You have a martini, and you have your cigarette, you know. It's so like one of the old movies. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it, you know, today there's much more of an awareness of all of the smoking is out of the restaurants and establishments, and you have like a clean, you know, clean air act, if you will, right? So I can't imagine going into a place and just sitting around with 20 people smoking. So you go into a building and you see a group of people outside the building <laughs> smoking, or people in a building sneaking to an open window to smoke. Um, they do have this addiction that's physiological yeah. and, and they'll psychological. go out in the middle of a snowstorm yeah. and smoke. I, right. Just recently we had mm -hmm. all that snow. See people on the snow and smoke a cigarette. How crazy is that, right? Because you say, what are you thinking? Aren't you cold? And you're smoking that cigarette, like, you know. As but a, again, it's an addiction. And, you know, they're not, their body is craving it. And yeah. so, the, you know, the cycle has to break. And that's where smoking sensation comes in. And similar to 
having group, you, you need the support. You need to have people around you. Just like Weight Watchers, now you can call a coach on your right. phone. Mm -hmm. So Smoking Sensation is similar to that, and we do offer Smoking Sensation at Richmond University. So we're, you know, it's a multi, it's not just one thing. And what's really interesting is that, you know, the patients have to see their primary care physician first. And they get the prescription if they meet the criteria. And the minute that patient walks out that door with that paper, they call me up. And, I'm sure they do. And they want it yesterday. Today somebody called, saw me in the lobby, and she said, um, I got that prescription. Can we do it today? I said, okay, sure. <laughs> and, you know, took care of everything. I said, okay. Come on down, we'll get it done. The whole procedure takes, the CAT scan itself takes all of three minutes. It takes right. me longer to get them on the elevator and bring them up yeah. to CAT scan. But people want peace of mind. They want to be able to know well, I think you at. are a really great representative. Like oh, you're, you. yeah, I think you as a first level meeting and walking meetings, like I, I could see where people would trust you. <laughs> no, I mean that. Don't you yeah, find that? Absolutely. About, yeah. You know, you, I don't know if I'm finding the right word, and you can yeah. fill it in for well, me. When I, when I teach nursing students at CSI, and you know, one of the exciting things is that there's such a diversity in terms of what nurses do, and you, you have to find the thing that's right for you. And obviously, you're someone that's in this role because you love it and you're good at it. You find it rewarding. You are. And you can see Thank that you. match. I saw it at the community board, but even getting better acquainted with you. I can see where it's just characteristically it, it, you're approachable, you're, I would trust you. Thank and I you. think that's Bye. a big thing and wanting to go for something like this, you have to trust that first initial meeting. Well, thank She's you. She's a great representative Nancy has your uh, cause. been at the institution for quite some time and when we were first uh, oh. starting to think about the program, uh, one of the directors of nursing said, I know the person who's perfect for that job. Mm. Well, we have to wrap it up. Thank you so much. We have information that's uh, at the end with a uh, phone number and uh, email and a website. So get out there, spread the word. Lung cancer screenings saves lives. Stop, Thank you again. Stop smoking. You have a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs>